I might as well start speaking. Yes, indeed. Uh, otherwise, we'll run out of time. And no doubt people have lots of questions. Well, it's a much better attendance than it was yesterday. When I, when I arrived on my own, having got the day wrong. <laughs> but it was an excellent full moon over the, the Tower Bridge. I wish I'd taken a photograph. The tower, you know, there it was, Tower Bridge, full moon and all the rest of it, HMS Belfast, brilliant. Now, the history of Israel. From the libertarian point of view, Israeli history is essentially one of disappointments, letdowns, might have beens, missed opportunities, and a partial, only partial recovery. Now, the Emperor Hadrian, don't worry, you're not going back to Abraham and so on. The Emperor Hadrian was the emperor at the last time, the last great Jewish revolt. There were many Jewish revolts against the Roman Empire. I won't bore you with them, because they all end the same way. The Jews lose horribly, loads of Jews wind up dead. You know, whatever the revolt is, it ends the same way. The Emperor Hadrian was the emperor at the last major Jewish revolt that actually matters for tonight. He decided to solve the Jewish problem by removing them completely. Um, the temple would be replaced by a temple to the Roman gods, etc. He didn't quite succeed. There were always a few Jews knocking around in the north in the Galilee area, where one of the two versions of the Talmud was eventually created, the other version being the one in Baghdad. Well, not Baghdad, it was Babylon in those days. Um, the Talmud being the Jewish scriptures or the commentaries upon them. But he more or less succeeded. There were very few Jews left in Judea, so the, name, the word became a misnomer. So you then have the Roman Empire, untroubled by the Jewish question, more or less. Um, it was alleged that the Jews who did continue to exist were spies for the Persians. This was denied. I'm not going to bore you with that debate. The Roman Empire becomes the Byzantine Empire, or East Roman Empire, depending on your point of view. It is then defeated by the first Islamic Empire, there are various wars with the Persians, which I'm also not going to bore you with. The Islamic Empire replaces it. You get the Damascus Caliphate. After the Damascus Caliphate, you get the famous Abbasid Baghdad Caliphate, which briefly moves over to Samarra, then back again. You then get the influx of the Turks, not the Ottoman Turks, as everyone thinks, another branch of Turks who behave a little bit badly. So then you get the Crusades, you get the period of the Crusader states. Eventually they are defeated. You then get the period of domination by the slave soldiers of Egypt, Mamluks, Barbars and people like that, and the Mongol invasions as well. You then, later on, get the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire brings us into the modern age, Anyone who's a specialist in any branch of the history of the Middle East is already going to kill me because of how well, I've just skimmed over the last 2,000 years. Where, Pardon? Where, the Middle East is a big place. Technically, it stretches all the way from Morocco on the Atlantic <laughs> Ocean to the borders of Pakistan and India. The biggest Islamic country, Indonesia, is not even in the Middle East. It's in the Pacific Ocean, between the mainland of Asia and Australia. Um, but the Middle East is predominantly Muslim, even though the biggest Muslim nation isn't there. Technically speaking, as caliph of all the believers, of all the Sunni believers, every Ottoman sultan would claim suzerainty all the way up to the Atlantic, because there are Muslims in Morocco, they technically belong to him, he would say. The local kings in Morocco would disagree. So how big is the Ottoman Empire is an interesting question. At various times it doesn't even control Egypt. During the early 19th century, Egypt tried to conquer it under Muhammad Ali. It also has persistent wars with the Persians, who were Shia Muslims as opposed to Sunni Muslims. 
there are also various different sorts of Shia Muslim. Technically, the Iranians or Persians are Twelvers, in that they believe in, in Twelve Imams. So, the short answer to your question is, it varies. With the First World War, the Ottoman Empire becomes quite small because it ceases to exist. It's defeated. The young Turks, with a puppet sultan, the last real sultan, Abdul Hamid, having been overthrown some years before, side with Germany, and they are defeated. Uh, General Allenby has various victories, including at one at a place called Armageddon, and that battle is very similar in scale, well not in scale, but in type, to the Armageddon of the Bible, in that the Turkish army does really, really badly at Armageddon, or Magego, whatever you want to call it. You then have a British mandate in the area, which is both sides of the River Jordan, what we now call Transjordan, or the Kingdom of Jordan, the Hashemite Kingdom, and the western side of what's then, to use the Emperor Hadrian's word, Palestine, which he gets from the Philistines. I'm not going to tell you who the Philistines were. Think Samson, well, not Samson, Goliath, throwing stones. That's where that word comes from. The Emperor Hadrian brought it back. You get a mandate in the area. What's the place like at that time? You have an area of malaria-filled swamps around what we as Christians would call the Sea of Galilee and the Jews call the Kinetit, the big lake in the north. You also have swamps, malaria-filled, along the coast, most of the coastal areas. Up in the highlands, you don't get that. You don't get the malaria, you don't get the swamps. You get sort of semi-arid conditions, some areas are quite nice, some are not. You also have fairly small towns, of which Jerusalem is one. And you have these towns knocking about. You have a mixed population, some Christian, some Jewish, some Muslim. What you also get is an influx of new people. You get an influx of Muslims from Egypt and other parts of the Middle East. You also get an influx of Jews from Europe, predominantly. Later, you get Jews from most of the Middle East as well. But in the early years of the 20th century, it's mostly European Jews. The Muslims went to the land are mostly from Egypt, but not exclusively so. And then you have the existing population, which was already there. You get a group of Jews, for example, particularly in Jerusalem, some people take this saying next year in Jerusalem, literally, and therefore decide to make it this year in Jerusalem. The British had made promises to both sides, which gets a lot of trouble. To be fair, different people had made the promises. So it's not, strictly speaking, someone's lying. You have one bloke representing the British Empire promising one sort of thing, let's say, to the Jewish Legion, and you have another bloke also representing the British Empire promising something completely different to, let's say, Lawrence of Arabia and the Arab Revolt. So you get different people making different, peop different promises to different groups of people. Which is the official British line? Strictly speaking, there isn't one. So there you go. We enter stage left as confused. The Balfour Declaration, named after the former Conservative Prime Minister Arthur Balfour, is the most famous of these promises. This is for a Jewish national home in the area somewhere between the Jordan River and the sea. In historical terms, or times, the Jews had also lived to the east of the Jordan River. But no one was really talking about so you get that's the most famous of many contradictory promises. The first person to put in charge after Allenby has actually won, the first civilian to be in charge is actually a Jew. He's a British Jew by the name of Sir Herbert Samuel. Now he feels in a very awkward position because he's a Jew. He's not an observant Jew, he's not a believing Jew, he's one of these radical liberal types he decides that he mustn't be seen to be pro-Jewish. 
So what he does is he puts limitations on Jewish immigration. He says, those Jews are already here, fine. Whether you came here hundreds of years ago, have always been here, came here last week, fair enough. But only a certain number additionally. Also, he says, not very much about Muslim immigration. To be fair, there's nothing he can do about that. Egypt at that time was also a protectorate of the British Empire. There was no way you could stop a Muslim leaving Egypt and entering Palestine. It's impossible. So you have a sort of one-sided immigration policy in the 20s and 30s. It's on and off. It's not all the time. Also, Sir Herbert Samuel is not the only person in charge. Uh, General Pluma, for example, is in charge at, for several years. He is unusual because no, very few people get killed under him. Anyone knows the Middle East, for any area not to have people being killed in it is unusual. How he does that, I'm not quite sure. But in the years Pluma's in charge in the mandate of Palestine, very few people are killed. Before him and after him, there are plenty of massacres. Very easy. Pluma is, I believe, his direct successor. He was a military man from the First World War, very eccentric, lots of white fur. Um, <laughs> very successful general in the First World War. The British, being perverted as we are, only remember our unsuccessful generals. <laughs> they got our own people killed, like Haig. You know, here's his badge. He invented that. They don't remember the generals that killed large numbers of the enemy. It's what Plumer did. It's sort of bad form for people to remember that. Um, Plumer's specialty was not getting his own men killed, it was killing the enemy. So we don't want to remember him. He's, he's weird. So, going back to Sir Herbert Samuel. Sir Herbert Samuel also appoints the Grand Mufti. Now, this is where you've got to understand the Middle East, or try to. The idea of a religious leader being appointed by the secular power is unusual. Even in the Church of England, it's notional. You, know, you have two names, we want you to pick this one. Is what really happens. The Church of England basically decides its own bishops. In the Middle East, at least in Sunni Islam, not in Shia, but in Sunni Islam, it was perfectly normal for the ruling power to pick the most senior cleric. It's entirely normal. It's done in Egypt to this day. However, what it was not normal is for someone to do the picking who was completely and totally ignorant. Normally, the civilian power or the military governing power would, in fact, be Muslim. Um, Sir Herbert Samuel was agnostic stroke atheist. Now, he received recommendations from the leading land-owning families in Palestine as it was then. He rejected all their suggestions and went to someone who was popular on the street because he thought that giving him extra power would tame him and make him civilised. He responded with great thanks and organising various pogroms. A pogrom is an attack, by the way. So the Grand Mufti was probably not the ideal choice. And if you want to know which leading Muslim families supported him in the area, the answer is simple, none. He's basically a rabble-rouser that heard Sir Herbert Bamiel was picked because he wants to be liberal. And he thinks, I'll pick a man of the people. And he knows absolutely nothing about what he's doing at all. Sir Herbert Samuel then later admitted, later on in his life, that this had possibly been an error. <laughs> um, but this was admittedly after, Sir Her after the Grand Mufti had declared his allegiance to Adolf Hitler. <laughs> which was sort of a, a bit of a giveaway that it had been a mistake selected. <laughs> he, by the way, also visited extermination camps, which I believe, someone will contract me if I'm wrong, Hitler himself never did. The Grand Mufti wanted to see the Jews die. He didn't want just pieces of paper which is all Hitler ever got. Hitler never saw Jews killed. Didn't want to see it. Um, there's a rumour about Hitler. He didn't even like abattoirs. He couldn't stand the sight of animals being killed. But there you go. Now, you have various fighting in the 1920s and 30s between various Muslim groups, various Jewish groups, as you had done during the First World War. 
because some Muslims stayed loyal to the Ottoman Empire. And you had done, even in the 19th century, Karl Marx of all people, who at one point denounces all businessmen as inwardly circumcised Jews, and this was not meant as a compliment, in spite of his own origins, denounces the treatment of the Jews of Jerusalem you know, in the middle of the 19th century. But the fighting gets worse. There are massacres, killings, that sort of thing. The standard thing that you expect in the Middle East, or in Ireland for that matter, or in many places in the world. But as I've already mentioned, you do have that odd plumer period where bizarrely people aren't killing each other. There's quite a lot of economic development in spite of this. I've been, for example, in the offices of the Haifa Electricity Company in Haifa, which is the head office of a major electricity company. There's a lot of economic development. A lot of people move to the area. There's a lot of jobs going. In mostly in Jewish-owned businesses, but not exclusively. You also get land sites. Now, again, you have to understand the Middle East. Most land is not privately owned. There's no edict of Quisse, 877 AD. The king of France cannot take land from one family and give it to another. That doesn't, that's not how the Middle East works. If you are a powerful ruler, of course you can take land from one person to give it to another. But why not? So there's very little privately owned land as we would understand the term. There's three different forms of tenure, which I won't bore you with again. There is a very small amount of privately owned land, genuinely privately owned. About half of that is sold. The other half remains under Muslim ownership to this day. The rest of the land is under tenure. The British could, could have altered that. The British could have said, all of this land is privately owned. The families that are on it now, you own it. You can sell it if you wish. The British did not do that. It's another of Sir Herbert Samuel's decisions. We will maintain the tenure system of the Ottoman Empire. You might think this is a very obscure point. It's not. It means land is politics. Who lives where in the area between the Jordan River and the sea is political. It's not primarily financial. You can't go to the landowner of most of the land and say, I want to buy this because most of the land is not privately owned. It's subject to political decision, which essentially means tribal decision. Who controls the government controls the land, which means you have to fight to control the government in order to control the land. That's what you do. Now you have various movements on both sides. The Jews are split into rival factions. So are the Muslims. Most people ignore the Christians. There were actually quite a lot of Christians there. They've gradually declined over time. If you go to Haifa, for example, you'll still find some. They're not in the zoo. They, they actually exist. Um, I've been in their churches because I'm a Christian myself. Um, they do exist, but they're not important. They never were. They're not the people doing the fighting on either side, not really. You have a steadily deteriorating relationship between the Jews and the British, particularly during the policy which is pronounced by Sidney Webb of the Fabians. Hands up, anyone knows what a Fabian is? Right, any advance on that? Fabian socialists dominated British politics in many ways. They're sent over there, Sidney and his wife Beatrice, I don't know if it's before or after going to Russia where they said everything was wonderful when tens of millions of people were dying. They said, you know, what we should do is have strict immigration controls and we should have strict controls on land buying and we should continue with this policy right throughout the 1930s. Now, the Jews who believed they were going to be killed in Europe and their friends in the Middle East took umbrage at that. Because they said, you're breaking your promise, the Balfour Declaration, and you're leaving our people to be murdered. Therefore, we don't like you anymore. And guess what that means? 
However, the real fighting did not occur until after World War II in terms of British versus Jews. You get a few people arrested during World War II and before World War II. The real fighting occurs after World War II, where you get various groups. The largest group, the Haganah, is fairly non-violent towards the British, not towards other people, but towards the British. Groups like the Ogun or the Stern Gang, for example, uh, have a different view. If you're dealing with someone, let's say, like Shamir, or the Prime Minister of Israel eventually, or Menachem Begin, who's also Prime Minister of Israel, their point of view is as follows. They fought the Nazis. They also, in Menachem Begin's case, fought the communists. He was actually tortured by the NKVD. And there's a file where the NKVD people actually protesting at their ill treatment of him, or rather his ill treatment of them, as they're torturing him. They make a complaint that he's abusive. <laughs> um, which I'm sure he was. I mean, he was that sort of bloke. Um, but he's a, no, he's a very, I mean, it's, it's a little bit hard. These are small men, because they didn't eat much as they, when they were young. They essentially starved. So they're physically small. So you think they're not dangerous. Unfortunately, they are incredibly dangerous. They're also people who have experienced the Nazis and the communists. So if you imagine a Vietnam vet, and remember Vietnam vets, or in Hollywood films anyway, they're always saying, you have to excuse what he's done because he's all these terrible experiences in Vietnam. Can you imagine experiences thousands of times worse than that? And what sort of person it's going to produce? Then imagine the way people talk in the Middle East, which is a very poetic idiom. If someone says, I'm going to kill you, your family, everything else, probably doesn't mean it. He might do, but he probably doesn't. It's probably a poetic way of speaking. You speak like that to someone like Begin, you won't get to the bit about, you know, I'll feed you to my goat, because he's killed you before, <laughs> long before you've got to that point. He will take everything literally, and he'll kill you on the spot. Because that's how he'll think. Jews fought among themselves to a certain extent. There's a famous case of the Itali, which is a ship which is loaded with supplies and people, including Begin, by the way. The Labour Party opens fire on the ship, sinks it. And they continue to fire with machine guns as the right-wing Jews are in the water. This is still remembered to this day. Remember, that's Jews killing Jews. The Jews also killed British, who also killed them. For example, when two Jews are hanged, two, Jew, two uh, British soldiers are killed in reprisal, and their bodies are mined. Now, this shocks the British army. But if you fought on the Eastern Front, as many of the Jews had, mining the bodies of the dead was entirely normal behaviour. Everyone did it. But it was very shocking for a British sensibility. You've killed so-and-so, how dare you leave a mine in there? A booby trap. Oddly enough, one of the two British soldiers who was killed was in fact Jewish himself. But he never mentioned it. He thought, if my friend is going to die, I'm going to die as well. I'm not going to tell them. So there you go. You also get the increasing violence of essentially Muslims versus Jews. Partly organised by the Grand Mufti, partly organised by other people. The war accelerates until the British decide to essentially leave it. Sort it out amongst yourselves, kill each other, we just don't care anymore. They leave. And they essentially mucked everything up for about 20 years or more. They leave in despair. Another thing you should remember is even after World War II, the British actually maintained their immigration policy. If you've been in Auschwitz or in Belsen and you had the number on your arm and you're seeing your entire family wiped out, they still try to keep you out. Now, when you're dealing with people like that, you don't treat them like that unless you want serious trouble. And they got it. So you then get that. In 1948, at the Grand Mufti's urging, a lot of Muslims, not all, leave. The Grand Mufti's argument was simple. 
We're going to have to wipe the Jews out. We can't do this on our own, the local Muslims in Greater Syria, or whatever you want to call it. We need the armies of Syria, Transjordan, including the British trained Arab Legion. That's also not forgotten. The army of Egypt, and if we can get it, soldiers from further afield. We'll need these. We need to wipe the Jews out, at least drive them in the sea, get them to leave. Now, to do that, we're going to have to have a big war. If fellow Muslims are here during the big war, they're going to get killed. Therefore, his recommendation was for all Muslims to leave. A lot of them didn't. Some Jews thought the Grand Mufti's idea was an excellent one and also in tried to encourage the Muslims to leave very directly. Most Jews did not, but some did. And as usual, you get the normal suspects such as the Stern Gang. We were only too happy for the, Jew, for the Muslims to leave. Most Jews didn't. Some Muslims remain to this day about a million Israelis are in fact Muslim. That's why you must never make the mistake of assuming an Israeli is a Jew. About a million Israelis are Muslim. They're also Christian Israelis. So you have to be careful. They're also Druze. Don't ask me to explain what a Druze is with a D. But it's another religious group. They're also Israelis. You're right, it's even a few Samaritans. Indeed, there are a few Samaritans. So they count as Israeli citizens if they're on the right side of the line. You have a big war. The war stops at a certain line. It's not a natural boundary. I've been all over it. It's where the armies happen to be. For example, if it, hands up, who's heard of the Gaza Strip? Good. Got better but more people. The Gaza Strip, there was a town called Gaza, which had about 30,000 people in it in 1948. There was no such place as the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is literally the firing strip of what was then the Egyptian army on the ceasefire line. What's a firing strip? Where you fire from. It's where you happen to be as you're firing. We control this particular bit of area between the Jews over here and the sea over here. We've got a supply line to Sinai at our backs. We're a bit exposed, but we've got this strip, and it enables us to bombard with artillery Jews over here. Oh, the UN's declared a ceasefire. We've still got this bit. Till 1967, and they lost it. In the north... The ceasefire line was essentially at the bottom of the Golan Heights. Golan Heights are hills. They continue to shell. Well, you must remember about the ceasefire that the UN negotiated in the United Nations 1948. It is not a ceasefire as such. It's the end of the big war. Killing still carries on. There's raiding on both sides. There's a lot of shelling from the Golan Heights into northern Israel on and off all the way to 1967. You also have the War of 1956, Israel versus Egypt. You have the remaining killing carries on. The boundary is literally where the armies happen to be. If you were unfortunate enough to be a Jew on the wrong side of that line, well, you were essentially going to the next world. So there you go. There are also about a million Jews in the rest of the Middle East who were persuaded in one way or another to leave their countries and go to Israel, as opposed to the next world. So you have a population transfer. Again, that's not unusual in history. You have Turks and Greeks exchanging population after the First World War, because a lot of Greeks lived in Turkey, a lot of Turks lived in Greece. After the First World War, there was an exchange in population. In the case of Israel-Palestine, there was also a lot of Muslims left, by mean, no means all, and the Jews of the Middle East, I think there are 5,000 left out of a million. They were kicked out to Israel one way or another. <coughs> the difference is, and it's an important difference, is the Jews who arrived in Israel were not treated as refugees. They automatically became citizens is why if you go to Israel today most Jews are olive coloured they look like Arabs because they are because they've had a lot of children and they come from Arab countries 
Whereas the Muslims who, were, who left Israel or were kicked out, whatever you want to say, were registered by the United Nations as refugees. And their children and their children's children are also registered as refugees. So you get a new nationality emerging in the world called Palestinian. You go to Egypt as a Muslim, but you say, I'm not an Egyptian, I'm a Palestinian. You go to Syria, you say, I'm not a Syrian, even though Syria claimed the area as great as Syria, I'm a Palestinian. And to this day, now, today, someone born in Lebanon, born in Jordan possibly, born in Syria, born in Egypt, if they can trace their line back to someone who was born between the Jordan River and the sea, will call themselves a Palestinian. In some cases, they'll do that even if they weren't. Yasser Arafat, for example, who was the first leader of the PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization, but it was formed in the early 1960s, was in fact born in Egypt. But he had fought for the Muslim cause. He identified emotionally and spiritually and therefore declared himself a Palestinian. Same as you get with a lot of other people. Edward Said, the most famous Palestinian in the world, he was in fact, by the way, a Christian, died a few years ago. When I say Christian, he was a Marxist. His family were Christian. He always said, I'm a Palestinian, not I'm an Egyptian. And technically, he was born in Jerusalem because he was taken there to a hospital to be born. He'll always tell you, the, or used to tell you the story about how his family was burnt down by a mob. His home was burnt down by a mob. He'd imply the mob was Jewish. Actually, the home was in Cairo, and the mob was Muslim. They were burning the house down because the family were Christian, and they were American Christian at that. They were employees of the American University, so they weren't Copts. They'd have been tolerated if they were Copts, but they were sort of American Christians. So his story of his life is essentially fiction. But you get a really big struggle. You get the 1967 war, which is essentially Jordan, Syria, and Egypt against Israel that ends in victory for Israel. Israel takes Sinai and the area now known as the West Bank as well as Gaza. A lot of the West Bank is closer to the Mediterranean Sea than it is the Jordan River. If you hear this term West Bank, don't get confused. You can be in the West Bank and nowhere near the Jordan River. You can actually be closer to the Mediterranean Sea. It takes about an hour to go from the West Bank to the sea at the narrow point. Put an armoured thrust over there, you'll cut Israel in two, no bother. You then have another war in 73, the Yom Kippur War, the October War, named the Yom Kippur War because the Muslims quite sensibly actually attacked during the Jewish holiday, thinking the Jews would be unprepared, which they were. There was actually a Muslim agent in Egypt who was a relative of NASA and was very close to Sadat, who was president of Egypt at the time, who did tell the Jews that they were going to be attacked, gave them the wrong date. A lot of people have speculated as to whether he was a double agent or in fact a triple agent. But I'll leave that to your own imaginations. They told them they were going to be attacked, but gave them a different date. The Yom Kippur War ends, now this is where I'm going to make a controversial statement. First, the uncontroversial statement. Syria loses the Yom Kippur War. I don't think anyone, even a Syrian nationalist, would say that Syria won the Yom Kippur War. A lot of Egyptians would say they won. Israelis would say, no, they were defeated. The Egyptian case is we ended the war with some territory in Sinai, which we did not have before. Therefore, we won. The Israeli case is there's an Israeli army on the other side of the Suez Canal, which is you know, approaching Suez and other major Egyptian cities. Your army is cut off. It's falling apart. It's the Americans who save you by de demanding a ceasefire. So there's an argument. Both sides, Egypt versus Israel, say they won that war. However, no one says Syria won it. By the way, in, when I say Syria, again, I'm using terms. There are Iraqi soldiers in Syria, 
There are Jordanians, there are Moroccans. Even though the Syrian government at the time was socialist, Ba'athist, Arab Socialist Renaissance Party, it appealed to the general Muslim community. Come help us, come fight. And some did. They would argue not enough, but some did. Didn't do them any good. Assad, who was the defence minister, blamed the president. The president blamed him. Assad solved the argument with a military coup. So the president gets the blame for Syria's defeat in 1973. Well, Assad's actually already in power. That was over 67 when Assad was defence minister. So that's a big mistake. So you have that struggle. You get a peace treaty with Egypt under Sadat. Give us back the Sinai. We don't want the Gaza Strip, thank you very much. Give us back the Sinai. You can have peace. All right. That's a very simplified version of the peace treaty. You get a sort of peace treaty with the Kingdom of Transjordan. Now this again is a bit of confusion. The Hashemites were not from Jordan. They were from Saudi Arabia, what's now Saudi Arabia. What was then just called Arabia. They were promised Arabia by the British if they fought against the Turks. They did. However, a man called Philby, yes, that Philby, the father of Kim Philby, decided it would be funny to betray the Hashemites and betray Britain, by the way, and give it to the House of Saud by leaking all their secrets to the House of Saud. Yes, treason does, in fact, run in families, in case you didn't know that. This was considered very funny by him. It's had unfortunate consequences as the House of Saud is Wahhabi. They are sulafates. They are supporters of the most strict form of Sunni Islam. I think there are four or five legal schools in Sunni Islam. That's the strictest. The Hashemites were not. They became kings of Jordan and kings of Iraq. The ones in Iraq died in 1958. The ones in Jordan are still there. They have a sort of peace treaty with Israel. It's complicated. Syria is still technically at war with Israel to this day, as are many other countries. You also have the population increase on both sides. This leads us into the strange domestic history of Israel. Remember what I said about Israel being a land of missed opportunities from a uh, libertarian point of view. You have a private army, voluntary funded, the Ugun, the Haganah, private armies. They become a state army. So sad for all you anarcho-capitalists out there. You also have a Labour government in 1948, which as well as killing Jews on the Afghali ship, also decides to nationalise a lot of businesses, mostly owned by Jews. But it doesn't matter because they're going to have this wonderful cooperative economy based on kibbutzes and kibbutzim. Uh, these have never made a profit. They finally, or the Israeli government, finally stopped subsidising them in the 1970s, whereupon a lot of them went bust. Put it this way, they were not a glorious success, although some still exist. There are various other forms of communal family, communal farming, some more successful than others. So you have this socialist dream. It doesn't work. It essentially fails. Bizarrely, Arab countries such as Syria and Egypt copy it and take it further. Egypt in 1952 with Nasser, Syria a few years later, I think 1963, they have their Ba'athist revolution. The Syrians and the Egyptians and so on, the Iraqis in the 60s, look at economic failure and decide to make it much worse and to take socialism even further. Um, it was very popular, you may smile, the British did precisely the same thing. Um, for example, in the 1960s, investment taxes in this country were close to 100%. That's fine for a while, you have your mini skirts and your candy floss, and then in a few years time, your manufacturing industry disintegrates, but that's okay, because Mrs Thatcher's in power, and you can blame her, even though you did it. So, don't sneer at the Arabs when the British did the same. 
but at least they didn't go around shooting many of their own businessmen. You have a severe difficulty <coughs> with rising population on both sides. Gaza, someone will correct me if I'm wrong, has gone from a population of 30,000 to a population, if you count the Strip, as well as the city of Gaza, it is a city now, something over a million. The Jewish population has considerably increased. The Jews also have turned away from socialism in the 20s, sorry, 70s and 80s, so that's why I talk about a partial recovery. They're also becoming a more conservative nation. Very unusual in the Western world. Over time, most Western nations have become less conservative. Illegitimacy rates have gone up, religious observance has gone down, etc. Israel has become more conservative, not less. Okay, I'm finishing. There are still atheist Jews, there are still kibbutzim, but that 1950s, 1960s thing is way out of date. Most Jews are fairly conservative. They have strong families. They're into private businesses, that sort of thing. One of the reasons the left has fallen out of love with Israel is it's no longer a particularly left-wing country. Questions from the floor? 